got two very amazing ancestors that I've always respected. Yeah, so the one I was thinking about with Monte Cassino is Elias Amory Lowe. Yeah, what an incredible guy that was. This this scholar of of um, yeah, he he specialised, as you know, in in um, you know the old writing um, codices of European history, and he started by looking at the kinds of script they were using in the monasteries. That's right, in places like Monte Cassino and and uh, Cluny and all the other great abbeys and, and monasteries, they all had their yeah, that's right. They all had their own, uh, like, scripts were all slightly different. Then the Anglo-Saxon script was slightly different. The Irish, the... That's right, in Gaul here, not far from where I am in Limoges. There was a great abbey there. saint Marcia, and they, they all were producing these amazing books, right? Yeah, we celebrated Adelard of Bath today in, in the Museum of Peace that I run here. And, and he, was, he was one that came and... Yeah, yeah, you see, true scholars would like to wander like Adelaide of Bath did. He, he went all over Europe. He came to Poitiers and Tours. Yeah, they're not far from me. So, anyway, your ancestor, this amazing guy, Elias Amory Lowe, he, as you know, he, he ended up um, being a professor at Oxford and, and one of the world's experts in European med medieval literature. And he'd studied particularly the scripts and, and writings from before the 8th century. Isn't that amazing? You know, there's loads of manuscripts still remaining in these in these libraries, and he actually went there personally. He went to, um, that's right, he got his PhD in 1908, I think, with a study of the script of Monte Cassino itself. Yes, Elias, yeah, what a great name. I mean, he was he was partly, well, he was Jewish, wasn't he? So Elias is, is like the great, you know, Jewish name, and then Avery Lowe. And he, he then produced that amazing um, collection, the Codices Latini Antiquar and Antiquariones, the, the study of all, I think it was six volumes or something, all the manuscripts of medieval Europe from before the 800s mark. Yeah, so he was in love with European scholarship and history and writing and the Latin language. I, yeah, I'm sure that's what inspired you, among other things, to become a Latinist and a scholar. Elias would be very proud of you, Boris. Don't, don't, don't you know, get me wrong here. Yeah, but look, he, he specialised in the Beneventian script, so from, um, yeah, from, from uh, Italy, you know, he was an Italianist. That's what I'm, the point I'm trying to come to, yeah, no, you, you got there before me, Boris. Yes, of course he would be, he'd be absolutely appalled at Brexit. Like, he, he's, in fact, I can see him now, you know, if I was a clairvoyant, I'd say I see him on a cloud jumping up and down. Telling me to tell you, Boris, to get off it and stop doing Brexit. You've just got to exit from Brexit. Like, there's no, there's no, yeah, no, that's what I think uh, Elias is saying. And as a Jew, he knows how important it is that, that we should all collaborate and work together internationally. Yeah, internationalism, yeah. No, it's not a Jewish conspiracy, it's a Jewish necessity. We have to be internationalist in our outlook if we're going to survive as a culture, as a one world. Yeah, you can't carve the world up into little bits called this or that empire. We tried that in the 19th century. Do you remember that game we used to play called Diplomacy and we'd all, and it's 1914 and everyone's a different empire. Yeah, those days have gone, Boris. We've got to have like one world, one unity, one... Yeah, that's right. No, well, I used to sit on the board of the World Federalists. I mean, they're lovely people, a bit ahead of their time, though. Um, but uh, anyway, so look, um, yeah, no, I love, I love Elias, so... Uh, I'm talking to his descendant, aren't I? And that's why I bother to ring you, Boris, because I know that there's some, yeah, residual intelligence in your lineage here. Yeah, and then, of course, <clears throat> as if that wasn't enough, um, yeah, so then Frances Lowe, um, that's right, she was uh, your grandmother, I believe. Yeah, she then married, well, I mean, an incredible guy, Sir James Fawcett of all people, 1913 to 1991. I mean, what another amazing ancestor to have in your family tree. Um, he was a very famous lawyer. Yeah, I, I used to, as part of the University of London, we have this thing called the International Institute of International Law, uh, which was right in Bloomsbury, just around the corner from my office. And I used to go in there and look at the library and just like be in awe of these books about international law. And the people there had helped found the UN and the European Court of Human Rights. Yes, Sir James actually helped. He was an advisor to the European Court of Human Rights. 
and and even to the UN uh, Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Yeah, he helped write the text. I think H.G. Wells um, produced the original draft. That's one of the one of the kind of views going around, and that this man, Sir James Fawcett, put it into kind of legal language. Um, yeah. So so again, Sir James Fawcett would yes yes you've got there before me, Boris. Yeah, he would be so against Brexit. That's right. He knows that you see. To have justice and international law respected is the primary duty of each nation state. Yeah. Yeah, we can't that hard Brexit. I mean, that's ridiculous. That's like that's like talking about a soft hanging, you know. Yeah, it doesn't work. If you jump over a cliff, there's no no no, it's not gonna work, Boris, is it? You know that. No, because Scotland will be leaving. That was the point I was making. Yeah, yeah. Um how do I know? Well, <laughs> Boris, you live in a cold, leaky castle for seven years and meet you know, meet the indigenous people, and you realise that they're really stuck in there, like, no, we're Scots, we're not part of the UK, we're off. Yeah, I, I was very innocent when I went up there. I thought, no, hang on, nobody, everybody likes the English, we're really nice people. I'd just been talking to Theresa May at one of my schools, and I was thinking, you know, we're, we're, all, we're all nice people here, aren't we? But, God, they hate the English. I, I used to get, like, stopped by the police and, and hassled, just because I had an English accent. Yeah, it was a, it was a nightmare. <laughs> As if the rain wasn't bad enough. But, you know, after seven years, I began to see it through the eyes of these amazing Scottish people. And I think, I think it seeped into me, like, like, like the rain. Um, and I realised that, hey, you know, there's a whole other narrative of history. Yeah, the English have been pretty abysmal to the Scots. Yes, yes, and even it's even in Karl Marx's book, you know, Das Kapital. I don't know if you've ever had a chance... No, you've never read it, no. Well, I had to read it for my studies because I did political philosophy at the university. Yeah, yeah, London. And, of course, yes, I did the PhD on the Cold War, right? So that's Russia versus the West. So you've got you to know your Marx. Well, Marx was really proud of the fact his wife was of Scottish descent. Yeah, you didn't know. No, no, well, many people don't realise. I mean, he was much more interesting than people realise. And, um, she, no, she wasn't Jewish. She was part Scottish, for God's sake. I can't. She was the real brains behind the whole production. It should be called not Marxism, but von Westphalenism. That was the tradition that she came from. That's right, descended from the Dukes of Argyll, who were based at Inverary Castle near where I lived. Yeah. Yeah, and it was her family silver that kept them going and kept Marx in, in enough pennies to go on writing Das Kapital. Yes, so <coughs> anyway, it's worth reading and Poor old Marx doesn't like the English either. I mean, he, he points out that they were pretty horrible to the Scots and to the Irish. Yeah, you should read him on the Irish famine, Boris. It's, it's not pretty. Yeah, and Engels, his, his, his colleague, had a... Had a he, he was in love with an Irish woman who was living in Manchester. You know. The Irish... No, the Irish are very intelligent people too. In fact, you see, the Irish and the Scots are the same people. They just, they just kind of go back and forth across the land. Yeah, yeah. And the Druids, you see, coming back to the Druids, yeah, yeah. Druids were their priests and, and intellectuals, the intelligentsia. Yeah, there's an academy, a Royal Irish Academy, and they've got an amazing library in Dublin. Yeah, yeah, no, you should go to Dublin more often. Trinity College, I recommend. It's got one of the best libraries in the British Isles, yeah. No, there are amazing intellectuals in Ireland. I've got many friends in Ireland. Yeah, so, anyway, look, I'm going to come back to Ireland, yeah. Yeah, no, I know it was a, it was a mistake, Boris. You, you can, but look, I'm trying to get to the point of showing you the way out. Yeah, the Scottish thing. No, the Scot. There's nothing I can do to help on that. They will be leaving the UK. Whatever happens with Brexit, if you go on with your Brexit nonsense, yeah, I know Dominic Cummings is is breathing down your neck, but I'll come back to that in a minute. Yeah. Scotland is leaving the UK. It's, there's just no doubt about it. Look at the votes at this last election. You won no mandate in Scotland. The Scots are, are <clears throat> rallying round Nicola Sturgeon. Look, even if you point... No, don't go down that route, Boris. Even if you poison Nicola Sturgeon or come up with some fake charges against her, they'll find someone else. You know, so, I mean, <laughs> there's a whole bunch of incredibly intelligent Scots. Yeah, you know, they, they, they will step into the breach, Boris. There's no point just, just bumping off Nicola. Uh, no, no, I, please don't go down that route. No, no. I mean, um, <clears throat> yeah, so the Scots are going to go. I mean, they've had it. And the thing you should realise, Boris, yeah, you see, I don't think you ever studied Scottish history in your degree, did you? Or since then. 
and and you've met some weird Scots, people like I don't know Michael Gove. These are not real Scots; they're just something weird. Um, and the real Scots have got a whole history of why they want to leave the UK. Now I know they had that referendum, but they're demanding another one. And I'm yeah, I'm afraid you won't be able to stop it. Now even if you get your best lawyers onto it, they've got really really good lawyers, and they'll be able to outfox you on that front. It'll go to the Supreme Court, and now you won't be able to shut the Supreme Court down in time. And also, you wouldn't be able to get away with it, Boris. There are, there are, <clears throat> there are sort of rules behind this game. So I think anything you're thinking about Brexit or not, you've got to factor in the fact Scotland's leaving the UK. And I'd say it's about 98% because of this Brexit policy that Theresa May adopted and Cameron. Yeah, the calling of the referendum was an absolute disaster. A complete, utter disaster. But what was really bad was the terms under which it was called. I, no ceiling, no requirement of majority, um, no kind of like every country has to agree on this, no, no thinking through the consequences. Yes, I don't think Cameron ever did moral education at school. I don't know what on earth his teachers thought when they trained him. Um, yeah, no, I, I've heard from people at Eton that, that he wasn't really that bright. Just, you know, had, had a kind of affable person. Yeah, my partner used to work at Carlton Ch Television when he was there. That was back in the old Islington days. Yeah. No, I mean, the guy's a PR guy, you know, but, like, you can't put PR guys in, in charge of running the railways. They'll just say everything's fine. Do you remember that guy, Chemical Alley? Everything's fine whilst the American tanks are already on the streets of Baghdad. You know, Cameron is like the Chemical Alley of, of the UK. Everything's fine. Referendum's great, you know, as the country's breaking up. Yeah, no, you're cleverer than that. So please don't let us down, Boris. You've got to derail this train before we go off the cliff. Okay, Ireland. Yeah, I want to come back to that. So look, <clears throat> yeah, Ireland. Okay, so look, I'm speaking to you formally at this point on behalf of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Yes, Truth, yeah, yeah. Truth and Reconciliation Commission for Britain and Ireland. Yeah, T-R-C-B-I. It's a, a trick B. Yeah, it's quite a good acronym, isn't it? Yeah, so look, it was inspired by Mandela's idea of let's have truth and reconciliation in South Africa, let's not have revenge killings and all that, with the end of apartheid, yeah. So the same idea in Britain and Northern Ireland after the Good Friday Agreement in 1997, which, yeah, I played a little role behind the scenes in that. I went off to Ireland, I did peace work. I, yeah, they're quite good on peace education in Ireland, actually. They've, yeah, it's not easy living through the time of troubles. I chaired meetings in Belfast, yeah. yeah. I met people who'd been involved in that terrible fighting. And I chaired meetings in Dublin as well. And, um, yeah, we look, this is the point, Boris. This is, look, have you got a notebook? Can you take a notebook out? You know, Make a note here that the, the fundamental, absolutely overriding thing about why we have to stop Brexit is we have to prevent violence ever breaking out in Ireland again. It's the one overriding thing. Yeah, look, I know your dad, Stanley Johnson. No, he's a, he's a maverick. Don't, for God's sake, you know, send him a PR person. Send him on a long holiday to Jamaica or something. No, his comment about, well, the Irish are going to keep shooting each other if they want, and that's irrelevant, and let's just let them get on with it. Yeah, that's... I'm sorry, sorry Boris, but that, that, that thing he said was terrible. You should be ashamed of your dad. If I had a dad like him... I'd be ashamed. I'd stick. I'd make him go away for a long holiday. You can't treat the Irish like that. It's outrageous. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, I written apology. Is the very that's right. Chair of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission for Britain and Ireland. Yeah. No, I'm formally saying I was disgusted by that attitude. Yeah. Okay. I'll accept a postcard. He can send it to me. An apology, right? Because you see that. I mean, any analysis of the Irish tendency to shoot each other is not. You can't, the point about the TRCBI is you can't leave Britain out. We, that's right, we do have something to do with it. It's not just the Irish like shooting each other, it's because, yeah, who's providing the weapons? They're coming on the one side, largely from the UK, and always have. Yes, and, and <clears throat> I know the Celts always used to do, you know, inter-tribal warfare, but on the whole it was kept quite civilised, and most of it was in the form of magical battles. Yeah, the, I don't know if you know Celtic history and stuff, but the Battle of Moitura, Mo these are magical battles. They fought with magical weapons. These people were psychics, you know, uh, doing doing wands at dawn. Yeah, that's how druids... Well, no, we don't fight, you see. We, we never fight. 
No, no, no. Only an idiot needs to draw the sword. Yeah, I have the peace sword of, of Britain and Europe, but I never use it for physical combat. No, I, I would be a failure as an archdruid if I ever had to get into a situation of physical combat. I try to think through the solution so that everybody wins. That's right, I'm like the Father Christmas of the peace movement. Yeah, yeah, in fact, I've got a sweater on that's all about Christmas. So look, um, what I'm trying to do, yeah, the reason I'm for this call, Boris, and thank you so much, your A's must be, is Macron still there? Oh, he's run off. Well, look, okay, I'm coming to the end now. This won't be long. Yeah, it's been a pleasure to talk to you too. Um, so look, I just want to say, no, Northern Ireland, that, that's a no-no with Brexit. And what's going to happen, Boris, you do realise, is that, that the Brexit thing will lead to the reunification of Ireland. The, the North has the right to vote in a referendum on future constitutional changes following the Good Friday Agreement. And, and they have to be given the option of rejoining the Republic as one country, which will get them automatic entry into the European Union again, post-Brexit. Yeah, yeah. No, that's what happened to East and West Germany. It, it's there. And the, all the demographic indicators are that the people of Northern Ireland will vote to rejoin the Republic, rather than sail on with England and half of Wales on a kind of Brexit nightmare. Yeah, no, I, I think I can guarantee, I'd say, actually, yeah, a little over 100% that the people of Northern Ireland will be leaving the UK over this Brexit thing. Yeah, you didn't realise? Um, well, I don't know who your advisors are, but you ought to sack them. Yeah, I'll, I'll come back to that in a minute, because I've got a proposal to put to you. Yeah, so no, I'm afraid Ireland is, that's right, Irish unification is happening as a result of Brexit. Yeah, of course Sinn Féin don't care, they've wanted this all along. A majority of moderate, decent, sensible Irish opinion has now been alienated by your Brexit policy, and Theresa May, you know, bless her, completely ignorant woman, uh, so that they're now just flocking, can't wait to jo rejoin the Republic. I mean, I'm a great fan of Ulster culture, C.S. Lewis and all that stuff, but this is honestly, this is, this is just diabolical. I mean, it's time that, that your advisors were sacked and the people of Northern Ireland got their referendum. And as I say, I think it's 110% probable that they will vote to rejoin the Republic. Um, so that's it. Goodbye to Ireland. And, well, I suppose it might, you know, if you, if you go ahead with this Brexit thing um, and don't realise what I'm talking about, then then uh, you'll go down as the Prime Minister that lost Ireland and Scotland for the UK. Yeah, it won't be called the UK anymore. It'll have to be called Little Britain. Yeah, like that TV series in Wales. Yeah, that was a joke. Yeah, it's <laughs> a nightmare. Yeah. OK, so look, um, <clears throat> so is there any way, you're asking, is there any way of keeping Northern Ireland still in the UK? Hmm. Well, it's very unlikely, Boris. I'm sorry, I have to tell you the truth, but... The only, the only slightly possible chance is if you... Yeah, it's almost impossible, but the only slight chance is if you cancel Brexit. That's right. I mean, I think you've got the majority now in Parliament to do that. I know Corbyn still wants his Brexit, but you can actually... You can cancel it in spite of what he says. No, you don't even need a second referendum. Just cancel it. You've got the power now. And then I think you might keep Northern Ireland in the Union if you turn the UK into something with a constitution in writing and... <clears throat> bring transparency to the Privy Council. Yeah, that it's so ridiculous. That antiquated bodies running the country behind the scenes. Yeah, yeah, bonkers, isn't it? Yeah, no, we need. I mean, look, going forward, to, it's like the Cryptia, Boris, isn't it? Sparta's secret service. Yeah, we don't want the Cryptia running the country, do we? No, no. Yeah, and do, by the way, do you know anything about the killing of my friend Mark Williams? He he was found mysteriously hung. Um, no reason for that. And he was with me working away to stop Brexit. Um, I'm, I'm still trying to find the paperwork. Can you ask somebody at GCHQ if they intercepted any signals? I don't know. It could have been American intelligence. could have been anybody pushing for Brexit. I don't know. could have been Russian. could have been God knows. You know, you take your pick. International intelligence agencies wanting to kill this guy so that he would be prevented from working with my Centre for Remain Studies. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you were foreign minister at the time, so it might have come to your notice. Have a look back on your notes. Mark Williams, he was a liberal Democrat, peace activist, intellectual. He, that's right, he was a lawyer. Good friend of mine. And he was found mysteriously hung. Yeah, just like the Cryptia, Boris. Isn't it shocking? So look, um, yes, yes. No, I'm just a philosopher. I'm not a politician, but I do want truth on these matters. 
Yeah, so that's why, by the way, can I just say, I hope you'll agree with me, the, the problem with politics today is that people don't tell the truth, yeah? That's right, moral virtue, you know, that's the whole point of Plato's work and the original academy. Yeah, I'm speaking as an academic, Boris. We believe in truth, honour and virtue. Yeah, it's old-fashioned, I know, but it is the only way to go. And if you don't live by that, then you live by lies, deceit uh, and, and militarism. You see, peace can only be built through truth. That's right. So that's why I propose. Look it up on the website. Uh, that's right. The, the campaign against political lying. I'm with Peter O'Born and others on this. But I'm going further. I'm saying we have to have a law in Parliament to make lying illegal <clears throat> with statutory penalty of being sacked immediately as a lord or an MP. Yeah, it's neat, isn't it? It's simple. I mean, you'd like that. I mean, look, you were even sacked from, from the newspaper once, weren't you? The Times, I think, for lying. I mean, you know there are consequences, right? Yeah, so why, why should MPs be any different? For God's sake, we look to them as our guiding moral, uh, you know, lodestars, so they can't lie, can they? That would be terrible. Yeah, I did about 35 meetings in the House of Lords with Lord Ennals and other MPs and Lords. Yeah, I was trying to get some deep thinking going for policy about peace. Yes, I think there should be a peace institute in London, you know, part of the university, but I think there should also be a freestanding um, Ministry of Peace. And, and, you know, peace policy is the, is the name of the proposed discipline. Yes, it should balance military policy, foreign policy. Yeah, defence policy, home policy and all that. We need a peace policy. Yeah, it's because we didn't have one in Syria. We didn't have one in Iraq. We didn't have one post 9-11. We never looked into the facts. We never demanded proof from the Americans who'd done it. No, we were led totally up the garden. garden look, Boris, I've got one question. Can you just answer me truthfully? Have you ever worked for any intelligence agency? Foreign, foreign, you know, <clears throat> or British for that matter. <coughs> you were never recruited by, by American intelligence? I'm surprised because you, you were a citizen up until 1990. Yeah, no... <coughs> No, no, I, I, I understand. You're like me, so you regard yourself as a man of culture and learning. You, it, uh, intelligence agency work would be too demeaning, wouldn't it? Yeah, no, we're, I call ourselves wisdom agents, Boris. We're trying to work for a world through wisdom. So, uh, yes, so look, let's get back to this point. So we've got to build a world of peace. This is the fundamental reason for my phone call. That's why I'm speaking to you as a peace studies academic. Yeah, it's a pity about that I don't have the chair in Bloomsbury because basically, you know, funding wasn't there and the politics. Yeah, yeah, the problem is our country hasn't prioritised peace. You could do that now you're Prime Minister. You could say, I've had a call with a very interesting academic. I've been rethinking my position. I've decided to cancel Brexit and we're going to prioritise peace. This great British country will pioneer peace throughout the world will become the world leaders. Yes, peace software. You could be developing all kinds of fancy kit. That's right. We could invent it, market it, sell it worldwide. Yeah, so you'd have it on your computer. It would be like conflicts. You'd type in the kind of parameters. The com I know people working in the Conflict Research Society could help you with this. Yeah, so take something like Cyprus or Syria or Libya. And there's all these complicated maps like The Economist has. Yeah, these conflict zones. Well, they're, they're really complicated. They need our software. They need British brains working on them. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, during World War II, we had a Ministry of Information where everyone was doing research. That was Senate House. That's where I did my PhD. Yeah, I love Senate House. I mean, it's you need a pretty intelligent brains just to figure out how the library works, I can tell you. And, and as for the LSE library, you know, it's impossible. All the code numberings are bonkers. I think they keep changing the books around overnight, like the bad fairies. But anyway, yeah, no, I've enjoyed talking to you. I, I think you've got the message. So look, I've got some really exciting news, a couple final points. So <clears throat> I've just been in India, Boris, and, you know, they're talking about you. And I was asked by some brilliant in intellectuals in India, academics and religious leaders, what I thought of you. And that's why I thought I ought to ring you when I got back, you see, because they were all a bit concerned. They said, surely Boris is, is more intelligent than realising he's going to break up the UK. I mean, what's going on? Has the guy got an ego the size of the planet? Yeah, that's right. You see, it's not ego. Ego doesn't exist. I was talking to a personal colleague of the Dalai Lama there, Geshe. Yeah, Geshe is like a PhD. That's, that's like me. I'm a kind of Geshe of the Druid 
and Christian community, and he was the equivalent of the Buddhists. He'd just come down from Dharamsala for the conference. We stayed up till midnight talking a couple of times. Amazing guy. Yeah, and his point, of course, is that you have to go beyond ego, Boris, you see. That thing, this Boris ego, that, 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 that's impermanent. It's going, it's going. It won't endure. No, the only thing that endures is, gosh, consciousness, you know, bodhicitta, the, the consciousness awareness of, of the oversoul, of the enlightened mind. That endures. So my enlightened mind is speaking to your enlightened mind. That's, that's you know, the Dorje wisdom that I'm talking about. That's right. So, anyway, India, to sum it up, it was the International Conference on Peace and Nonviolent Action. I know it's a mouthful, but if you say ICPNA, it, it, it's easier. And there are about, I don't know, 200 people. We, we met in a Jain ashram in the middle of Delhi. And it was like going to heaven. I, I love these people. There were men and women from all over the Commonwealth, all over India, all over the world, Americans, Russians. In, you would have loved it, Boris, if only you could have, you know, uh, done a paper it would have been great i chaired a couple of sessions there was a talk by one of the most important newspaper men of india like the rupert murdoch of india yeah he spoke about the need for a new human thinking how we can build a better world without changing our own natures to be better yeah and then they asked me can you believe to to do the final declaration which i wrote up i got very inspired and i wrote it in the form of poetry actually didn't even put it into prose. I mean, there's no way you could sum up a conference like that in, in prose. You'd have to fill encyclopedias. There were so many learned scholars. So I just did a sort of Shakespearean blank verse poetry prose type thing. Yeah. No, I'll send it to you. Yeah. What, what's your email? Sorry, your private email. Okay. 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 No, I'll do that. Yeah. Johnson.boris at gmail.com. Yeah. No, that's fairly easy. I'll do that. Okay. Yeah, so, um, <clears throat> and anyway, it, it was an amazing and moving experience. And the other thing that happened there, whilst I was there, was we had the World Intellectual Forum gather. No, no, that's not the World Economic Forum. No, that's the thing in Davos that you've been to. No, no. We're a sort of an alternative um, uh, initiative. We, yeah, yeah, you see, the world's problems are not just economic. They're economic plus plus, right? So we're the economic plus plus bit. Yeah, we're just the World Intellectual Forum because we believe that you need other kinds of joined up thinkers, not just economists. Yeah, in fact, you, you and I know that economists actually create the problems, don't they? Yeah, I mean, for God's sake, you know, <clears throat> Marxists versus capitalists versus Friedmanites versus, you know, whatever, whatever. I mean, and you still don't know how to make countries wealthy or whatever. I mean, look at poor Venezuela. What are they doing wrong? Yeah, I mean, I mean, the economy is going, going down, but, I mean, it's all so complicated, isn't it? As you said in your speech to the UN, I mean, that rant you gave about artificial intelligence and stuff, yeah. No, no, I, I mean, I appreciated the rant, but I think what we need to have is natural intelligence, Boris. We need to find a way of reactivating human intelligence. Like, that's right, human int, it's called. Yeah, that's like you and me talking to each other. Yeah, it's, and the way we do that is education. So we stress natural intelligence. Next time you speak to the UN, Boris, please have a second thought and, and stress that Britain is a leader in natural intelligence cultivation, high education. All students will stop coming to our country. Profs like me will have nobody left to teach because they'll all be watching robots, you know. Yeah, we don't... No, actually, human one-to-one -one contact, like we're doing now, is the only way to get... That's right. You see, you can talk to robots till the cows come home, but they'll only have as much intelligence as what's programmed into them by the people. And, and so <clears throat> it's only when you bear the human heart and all its mysteries. Yes, because that, that intellectual leaping acrossness that happens when proper people talk, that's right. You know, there's an old Middle English saying, it's called, good wits do jump. Yeah, that's the motto of my institute, which I found, as I said, in Bloomsbury, because... Yeah, that's right. What we're trying to do is change the world through the good wits jumping so that people's vision and inspiration can be shared, so that good people come together and transform the world. Yeah. Yeah, I, we want you to be on the team, Boris. Yes. So this World Intellectual Forum, yeah, I'm the coordinator for Europe and Britain, right? And it'd be an honour to have you on the team. As long as you stop Brexit, that's the caveat, you know. Um, I'll give you some tips on how you can do that because I know you're in a bit of a sticky wicket 
Yeah, and <clears throat> you know the tragedy of what we were doing. We some brilliant minds were there. I'll send you the report. Yeah, but the tragedy was we were in Delhi at the time, and all these riots were kicking off between Muslims and other groups. Yeah, it's a tragedy. I'm sure you've expressed your condolences to the Prime Minister, but I'm not sure it's going to help because it seems his policies, the BJP party, have been underlining it. I mean, <clears throat> oh God, where does one begin? I mean, I think we should go back in time, invent a space time machine, and stop the bullet hitting Gandhi because the people that killed Gandhi, who's one of my intellectual heroes, are the very people now running India. It's like a time warp. We've got to go back and stop the bullet, Boris. If you got in touch with any good British inventors, can you please invent a time machine? Go back, stop the bullet hitting Gandhi, and we'll get the whole thing going right. Yeah, I don't think it matters if you interfere just a little bit in the past. I think... I'll check on the ethics of that. I'll talk to my... Uh, yeah, I've got, I've got contacts in the sort of spiritual worlds that can advise on the ethics of that. But no, so India's going... going <clears throat> no, it's terrible. What... You know the story. What they've done is they've introduced this law that A, requires all citizens of India to prove they're citizens of India. And if you don't have the documentation going back, I don't know, 70 years, you're, you stand in jeopardy of being kicked out or something. <coughs> well, that's ridiculous because lots of people in India don't have that kind of documentation. So you're, you're creating a climate of fear and disenfranchisement and insecurity overnight. They've done that in Assam and found 13 million people aren't properly Indian, and yet they're as Indian and as Hindu as anyone. So, I mean, of all the stupid bits of legislation you could dream up, that's like, you know, up there with the worst of them. <clears throat> and then there's this other silly thing they're doing, which is, yeah, I didn't know about it because we don't really cover Indian news in our press anymore, do we? But um, it's tragic because they are part of the Commonwealth, and, yeah, from the Commonwealth, we ought to be concerned about India and... So there were all these riots and fights and Molotov cocktails going off in Delhi. We were talking about peace and they're all fighting. Because this government, bless it, bonkers, has brought in this law that says that anyone from a Hindu background can come to India from neighbouring countries. Pakistan or Bangladesh or Afghanistan, which is like not actually neighbouring, so that's weird. Yeah, and they can just turn up in India at the passport control, say, hello, I'm a fleeing Hindu. Uh, can I have sanctuary in your country? And the Indian government will say, yeah, come in freely. Well, they expect about 26 million people might come in through the frontiers. Yes, anyone can come apart from... That's right. No, even Christians can come because they're being persecuted in these countries. But weirdly, and this is the weird bit, you can't come if you're a Muslim or a Jew. Well, that's kind of, yeah, anti-Semitic. I mean, it doesn't do it justice. It's just bonkers. Like, um, <clears throat> yeah, so, and the, yeah, no, the Muslims don't like this. And there's about, I don't know, a quarter of all Indians are Muslims. And so they're, they're rioting in all the different cities of India that I know and love. I mean, Patna, where I was a few years ago. Calcutta, of all places. Chennai, what we call Madras. Yeah, where Fort St. George's. Yeah, yeah, now that's where um, so much of British history is. When I was in the church there, I saw Prince Charles' signature when he was visiting there with, with Princess Diana. You know, amazing. This is our culture too. I'm writing a dictionary of Brit British um, intellectuals in Indian history. We contributed so much to their culture for 300 years. I think what the British did in India, above all, the most important was this sense of tolerance, fair play. Yeah, Sir William Jones, yeah, he was one of my heroes. He, he was a Druid, did you know that? Yeah, I'm in the, I'm in the Jones tradition. He, he, he was the founder of the... Discipline of Indo-European Studies. That's right, he learned Sanskrit. He first discovered that Welsh, Latin, Greek, Sanskrit, they're all one big language family, including English, called Indo-European. Yeah, I, I go a bit further. I say that it's related to the Hamito-Semitic language family, but that's what I wrote in my Kabbalah Runes book. You're welcome. I'll send you a copy for Christmas. Yeah. <clears throat> well, you're going to get the talking book, you know, uh, if you'd rather. Yeah, I'm sure you don't have much time to read, but Anyway, look, Boris, to come to the conclusion point here is what Prime Minister in their right minds would bring in a law that is going